This is Pass for Two, People and Places, brought to you by Jules Verne, taking you around the world, sharing memories and introducing you to the people at the heart of everything we do. I'm Abby, and in this series, I'll be delving into past adventures, inside stories, future journeys, inspiring you to discover the wonders of the world. Welcome to the latest episode of Pass for Two, People and Places, brought to you by Jules Firm. On this episode, I'm delighted to be joined once again by General Manager Debbie and one of our regular travellers, Denise. Hi both, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Very well, thanks Abby. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you, Denise, for joining us. It's wonderful to have you in the office here with us today. It's my pleasure. Thank you for asking me. No, it's what I will. I can't wait to hear all about the, the many tours you've been on with Jules Verne and also how you met Debbie. Hmm. So, should we start with that? How did you two actually meet? Well, we I went to Burma. Um, it was our first departure on a particular um, tour to Burma. And I just went along with the first group just to make sure that things were running as they, as they should be or as we hoped they, that, that they would do. And uh, Denise was on, on that tour and uh, we've kept in touch. So when, De- when Denise arrived in the office earlier today, we were talking about our favourite memories from, from, from that trip. And I think the one thing that stands out is one particular day when we were going on a fairly long journey and the bus broke down. Oh, OK. Yeah. And Denise, for you, was the bus breaking down one of these amazing experiences? <laughs> It was actually. I think we we had a, an afternoon. I can't remember how many hours, but we had a, we had at least I would say three hours or so. Mm-hmm. Um, fortunately, it broke down in a little village, and uh, there was a little cafe. Might be it sound a little bit too formal, <laughs> but uh, there was a little cafe, shall we say, beside the road that a, a lady was running. And essentially, she had her best afternoon of business ever. I think because we were all sitting there getting drinks and having a little snack and just biding the time waiting for a replacement bus to come along. There was that and then there was the day that, you know, the little boat that I was on needed to be bailed out by the person who was rowing it. But that's another story for another time, probably. This sounds a very adventurous tour that you both went on. So let's start with the bus breaking down. So this bus has broken down. Mm -hmm. You're in the middle of this village. Mm -hmm. You're giving this cafe proprietor (laughs) The best <laughs> afternoon of her probably her business life, and we what, what were you just all talking? What what happened? Why is that such a fond memory for you? Because it sounds to me like a nightmare memory. I think it was a couple of things. I mean, I mean, partly it's it's the unexpected things that happen that give traveling. I mean, that's what you do. That's what you want when you travel, isn't it? You 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 want to go to a location. You want to see things. You want to experience things. But it's the things you don't expect that often give things the most meaning or, or give them the most flavor or, yeah. you know, bring a smile to your face. Um, some of the people went walking up and down the streets in the village. But, yeah, it was great. Oh, and and the eggs. I don't know, Debbie, if you remember the eggs. There was yeah. at the little shop beside this little cafe, um, They were there were some eggs that were about to be delivered. So there was a fellow there on a motorbike, I would say, motorbike, moped, that sort of a vehicle. And there were these eggs stacked up on the back. But they were massive layers of these eggs. I actually have a picture of him. And they were stacked on the back of his motorbike. And he then hopped on and went scooting off to go deliver them to wherever the eggs were going. I got a great photo of this pile of eggs on the back of a bike stacked up. Gosh. But it was, yeah, it was just watching life go by. I think yeah. that's the thing. You know, you're not at a tourist site. You're just in people's village watching them live their daily lives. And, yeah, that's what traveling's all about. Yeah. yeah, that does sound actually, although I think, you know, you'd be sitting and thinking, oh, the bus is broken down, what a nightmare. But actually what you've just described is the perfect way of seeing local life without intruding and just yeah. sitting back and relaxing and enjoying what's going on and going with the flow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Which is always good when you're part of a group. Mm-hmm. Yeah, And I think that, you know, perhaps at the time when it's happening, you do, you know, we were going from A to B and we wanted to get to B it's it's when you reflect back on it and when you reflect back on your whole time in that country and when you pull everything together and all your memories together that actually you can appreciate 
those times, which, you know, maybe when it's happening, there isn't, you know, that that appreciation quite so much. But it was it, it was great. And like Denise said, it's just kind of seeing that that local life. You're not at a tourist site. You're seeing a different side to the destination. And that's what it's all about, isn't mm. it? So I am sure everyone who's now listening needs to know, and I need to know, what's this story about a boat in a bucket? Oh, the boat. So this was at, um, that was it, Obane Bridge. And um, we were going to watch the sunset. And I, mean, I think the picture is probably in the, in the Jules Verne brochure. But it's a famous place where you go and you watch the sunset behind the bridge. And the best way to get the view is, of course, to be on the lake. So what do you do? You get on a little boat. And so we would have two of us on a small wooden boat, like a rowboat. And one of the local gentlemen would be, would be doing the rowing for us. And, and so I was there with another lady who was on the trip who we're still in touch with and, and chat with regularly. And we went out and we were like parked, as, such as you are, on the, on the lake and staring up at the bridge and watching the sun start to go down. And um, she was sitting in front of me and suddenly I could hear this little bit of like sploosh, sploosh, sploosh. I turned around to look and the, our, uh, our rower had a, had a bucket, a plastic bucket, kind of like, a, like an ice cream pail kind of a bucket. Okay. And he was literally scooping water out of the boat and tossing it over the side. And I, mem I do remember I just smiled at him. I thought it was hilarious and he grinned and then I started laughing. And Diane turned around and I said, check this out. And, and we got into a bit of a laughing fit, I have to admit. It wasn't, the, wasn't probably the first one, certainly wasn't the last laughing fit we had on this wonderful, amazing journey that we had. Um, but we did manage to get a photo. I just leaned to the side. She got a photo of him bailing out our boat. Everybody in the boat surrounding us was looking at us like we were a little bit crazy because we weren't, we weren't the least bit worried about the fact that he was bailing out the boat. But <laughs> again, it's an, you know, it's an amazing memory and it made that... You know, you'd think watching the sunset behind this bridge would be a magic memory, but part of the magic was getting the boat bailed out and laughing all the way back to shore. So, yeah. And that's what you remember, don't you? You remember the laughter and you remember the feelings. You don't just remember the thing you were taking a photo of. You remember exactly. that story behind it. Mm. Yeah. That's wonderful. Mm. So it sounds like you had a really adventurous trip, both of you, to Burma. <laughs> It was. It was a. It was a complete adventure, and um, and it was good to have a, a debrief at the end of the day over dinner or, or a gin and tonic. We were really far away from home. You know, a fabulous de destination, a great group of people. Yeah, it's it's something that stays with you. I think. Wonderful. So, Denise, I have to ask you, you we, we've alluded to and we've said that you are a regular traveller with Jules Verne. And this was before you met Debbie in, in Burma. You travelled oh, yeah. with Jules Verne before. So how did you find us? How did you come to be in the Jules Verne fold? Ah, well, we have to go back to 2004. OK. <laughs> so in early 2004, it's the first time I was I was living here in the UK. And um, I booked myself on a trip with a a tour company that no longer exists okay. to go to Egypt. And, uh, and I was on that trip. And as you do, you get talking to people and you make friends. And um, there were, first of all, there were quite a few people on there who were talking about, oh, they'd been to Jordan. What a wonderful place to go Jordan was. But I became friends with, with a couple who were on the trip and we kept in touch after. Does the story sound at all familiar? <laughs> and um, it was probably about 11 months after we got back from Egypt, Janet called me up one day and she said, uh, Roger and I have booked ourselves on a trip to Jordan. We're going in two months. You've got to come on the same trip. It'd be great. And I said, wonderful, perfect, I'll do it. And she said, great, I'll send you the details. It's a company called Voyage Jules Verne that we're going with. Yes. And that was it. So uh, we did that trip and it was brilliant. Uh, loved it. I mean, Petra was beautiful. Wadi Rum was astounding. It was just, it was an amazing, amazing trip. Left the country. And that was it. And I just thought, well, geez, these people know what they're doing when it comes to an itinerary. And so I've done another 10 trips since then Wow! over the years. So it's adding up. I actually looked back at my list of vacations over the weekend. Say, well, I wonder how many trips it is now. Yeah. So 11 trips in total. 11 so, yeah. trips. Amazing, huh? It is. It really is amazing. So has Burma been the last trip you've been on or has there been anything since then? Uh, there have been a couple since then, actually. Okay. I, I did a couple. I had a little bit of a, a break between, um, between work. And I went to, in early 2020, I went to Tunisia. And I also did the trip down to Victoria Falls in Botswana. 
Wow. So Victoria Falls is somewhere that has always captured my heart. But what did you think of Victoria Falls? Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Absolutely beautiful. And it's funny, you know, on the on the way down, I mean, sometimes people talk about, oh, will there be a lot of water? Or will there be too much water? What will it be like? And I think we hit it right at the perfect time. Yeah. Uh, so that was February, and it was just a nice time. There was lots of water, but not so much you couldn't actually get your camera out and take a photo for fear of it being drenched yeah. by, the, by the downpour of the mist. So, yeah, if you're, if you're walking along the Zimbabwe side, you walk for, I think it's more than a mile, I think. Yes. Yeah. Um, but you do it in a leisurely way. And there are all these different viewpoints. And every time you stop and walk out to the, to the sort of the edge of the cliff, so to speak, and look over, you get a really different perspective. And it is, it's just beautiful. It's a very, I think it's a, one of those kind of once in a lifetime sort of destinations that most people probably do have on their bucket list. And it certainly did not uh, disappoint. Let's put no. it that way. It's definitely one of those places I think everybody at one stage in their life needs to visit and stand and see the water going over the side and realising how powerful Mother Nature is mm. and how small we are compared to compared to her and what she can give us. Absolutely. So it's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. And how about Botswana, Denise? What did you think of Botswana? Loved it. Um, I sometimes have these moments when I'm on a holiday where I don't want it, to, I really don't want it to end. Like, not just like normal, but actually I think, well, maybe if I just strategically missed the plane back, um, I could just stay here. That is a place I could have stayed for for a long, long time. Um, we were in, we were in Chobe National Park for a while, and that was, and that was wonderful. And I think what was really amazing was when we were in the middle of the Okavanga Delta, and you fly in there on a little... I don't know, 10 or 12 seater plane and you land and it's just, I mean, I don't know how to describe the airstrip. It, it was paved, I think, but it's literally in the middle of jungle plants. There's nothing else there. There was a little lean to with a fire extinguisher, I do remember, and a first aid kit attached to it. And that was it. And as we were coming down to land, you see this little Jeep and there are two guys in the Jeep and go, well, they must be there for us because there's nothing else here. And yeah, it was just magic, and the 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 eco camp that that we stayed at was brilliant, just absolutely magical. So everything from you know the food was wonderful, the staff were terrific, the guides were amazing, the wildlife was astounding. And actually, the first night in particular, I do remember because we stayed we're in tents. It's definitely glamping. It's not it's not rough camping, but um, but it is under canvas with a wooden floor. And I remember the first night, it was quite windy, and you could hear you know, the, the sides of the tent flapping around. But also you hear the animals. Uh, and I do actually remember the, the camp manager telling us that there was a pregnant lion who was kind of meandering around, and, oh, you might hear her at night. And she walked past my tent, I think, at night, and it wasn't like I was jumping up and opening up the, the tent flaps and going out to check. <laughs> but um, but I did hear, because I could hear the, the grunting noises that she was making as she was walking along. But that's it, you know, you're, you're lying in bed and it's complete silence. And then you hear the tent move or you hear an animal. And it and it just alerts you and you wake up because it's it's such a, it feels loud compared to the, the silence that you've been in the middle of. I think it's a little bit like the stars in the sky because it's completely black, of course, as well. You're, there's, there are no lights. Um, and then, you know, if you if you bother to pause and actually look directly up, you see all these beautiful sparkling stars as well. So yeah, there's something quite magical about being pretty much in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, amazing, huh? Sounds amazing. Mm. It was yeah, it was just it was absolutely beautiful. And I would I would love to someday go back and do that one, but I've got other places still on my list. So maybe one day I will go back again. I think. From what you're saying, you can definitely hear that Botswana is the place where you're thinking, take me back and take me back now. Yeah, yeah. It was it was really magical. I highly, highly, highly recommend it. Um, it's just I'm thinking back now. <laughs> I'm probably going to go home tonight and get my photos out and start looking through them again. It's yeah, all about it the wonderful. memories. It's all about the it memories is. that we make and all about the memories that we keep. And, and you can tell that's a, an amazing memory that you have. Yeah. So it's safe to say that you are quite an independent traveller. You do a lot of research, you have a look at where you want to go, you have a look at various different itineraries, whether it be group touring, individual, all of these different things. So what is it that's made you go on 11 group tours? What, <laughs> what's that pull that brings you into a group tour environment? 
I think it's partially the fact that with Jules Verne, it's not a massive group. You know, it is it is small group journeys. And the ones I've been on, well, the smallest one was Botswana. There were six of us. Um, and, oh gosh, probably the largest is maybe 20. But generally when I go on a trip, it's probably about 12 to 16 people. And it's a really nice size, I find, because I, I do travel on my own. So depending on where you're going in the world, at least for me, some places I don't want to be maybe entirely by myself. And it's just nice. I've, like you say, I, I do a lot of research. I've got a list of places I still want to go. I know what I want to see there. I'm, I've got a bit of an overdeveloped sense of adventure. So I, you know, I do my research and I make my lists. But sometimes it's nice to have somebody else do the logistics of the scheduling and the planning and take care of things. And some locations are a little bit harder to get around and, and, and work your way through all of the, the logistics that are part of traveling. Uh, and it is nice to go, I find, with a group of that size where, it's like I said, I mean, the, Debbie's not the only friend I've, I've made off of a trip. Janet and Roger aren't the only, there are others as well. And it's just a nice size where you, you know, there are enough people where you can kind of have different conversations. You hear about where other people have gone. You've clearly got a shared interest in wherever the location is you are then. But then you get talking about other places you've been as well. And sometimes I get things added onto my list as a result of those conversations. But it's just nice. You you meet like-minded people, and like I say, I formed some some lifelong friendships off the off the size of the group. And I always find that the itineraries that Jules Verne puts together as well go to go to all the things I want to see. But then they throw in different different experiences that maybe I would never have thought of. And I think that probably you know, Debbie would say a lot would know a lot better than I. But it probably speaks to the fact that the local guides you use are so brilliant. You know, they, they know their country, they, they bring that aspect of it. It's not like you're there with someone who's from somewhere else taking you along the trip. It's, it's local people showing you their country. You are right, Denise. Guides do make the experiences, for sure, but they're not the only ones, are they? And Debbie, you would know that from being on tours before, that it's not just the local guides, it's people in general that make these amazing experiences. Yeah, I think when we're travelling to these places around the world, you know... Yes, we're going to these countries to see what that country has to offer, but it's got so much to do with with the people there, and um, we go there to 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 meet those people. Our guides are, are wonderful, but quite often they're weaving into our itineraries these experiences, um, which sort of allow people to to immerse themselves, I suppose, in in that culture one, whilst they're there. And I think they are one of the most memorable things. Denise, I'm guessing that you've, you know, you, you've experienced one of these experiences. What was your favourite one? I think probably in Uzbekistan. Um, and we did. We had a wonderful, wonderful guide there. And when we got to Samarkand, which was his hometown, the special experience we had there was actually going to a home. It was actually these people's home, but they had a wonderful large courtyard out front and they had tables there. We went there for dinner, basically. And um, and they made a local dish, and oh, we had a wonderful meal. But they were they were friends of his family. Our, you know, our local guide knew them, and so when it came to you know how can we make this experience in this city a little bit unique and not just go to all these you know wonderful buildings that you see photographs of, we went and had dinner with a local family that does this regularly, and it was his recommendation: let's go to this particular place and let these people cook for us, and it was brilliant. Fantastic. It's absolutely wonderful. It's great, isn't it, to do things like that? It's those little extras, isn't it, mm. that really make everything, and I think it really makes the, the trip. So we said earlier, you're an independent traveller, you do lots of research, you have a number of tours that are next on your bucket list. Yeah. So is that list ever growing? Are you Once you tick one place off, have you decided that you need to add more? Do you go back to the same place? What sort of motivates you to travel? Oh, gosh, I have an overdeveloped sense of adventure. I may have mentioned it earlier. Um, but I do have a list um, of places that I want to go to. And, and it's interesting. It does sometimes grow. I was thinking earlier today, have I ever taken anything off the list? And the short answer is no. I can't recall ever having taken a location off the list. Some locations that I've got, some countries that I've got on the list are not currently safe to go to. Mm -hmm. But... Um, Others weren't, like, for example, you know, we went to Burma. There was a point where Burma was not a place 
you could really go to, certainly not very easily. Um, so I'm hoping Mali eventually is open again to tourists. But um, but I do sometimes have the list grow. So for example, I went to Egypt, people talked about Jordan, I went to Jordan. So sometimes I do add places onto the list. I don't tend to go back, although there are a couple of places I do want to go back to. But I guess it's because the list is so long and there's so many amazing places to see in this world. It's a really astounding planet we live on. So. So far, I'm trying to work my way through the list, and yeah. But I will eventually get back to a couple of very special locations. Mm, definitely. And how many countries have you traveled to so far, Denise? 59, 59. so far. Oh, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. I remember when I first put a list together, actually, was when I, was tra when I went to Antarctica a while back. And there was a lady on the boat who was 70 years old, and she'd been to every other continent, and this was her, you know, go to the seventh continent, go to the last place. And I remember she said she had a list. And I thought to myself, I wonder how many countries I've been to. And so that night I started writing down, and at that point it was maybe 20. Um, but yeah, ever since then I've just been kind of keeping track. And where is number 60, do you think? Where is that going to be? Well, 60, hopefully, fingers crossed, is a long weekend in Lisbon coming up in, uh, in Portugal, coming up in August. But I think after that, probably the next one is going to be Costa Rica. Wonderful. Lovely. Have you been to Costa Rica, Abby? I have been to Costa Rica. I went on, funny enough, an escorted tour to Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. um, it's a wonderful destination. Mm -hmm. it's, it's got the most beautiful wildlife um, I'm not a bird watcher myself, but you can really appreciate the birds, you can appreciate the, the, the nature, the flowers, everything. The hotels are so respectful of their impact on the environment. The way you see the wildlife, again, is just respectful of you are in something else's home. It's something else's habitat. Um, it was probably one of the best places that I have ever been to. I would highly, highly recommend it. Yeah. Um, one of the things I probably would say that I loved the most about Costa Rica was the mix between adventure, um, zip lining, hiking, getting the binoculars out, looking for howler monkeys in the morning, waking up, you know, under the tree canopies and listening to, again, like you said with Botswana, all of these sounds of nature, but then also relaxing on the beach, seeing the, the Caribbean Sea come in, watching out that the monkeys don't steal your lunch, those sort of things. Costa Rica is, is fantastic, and I think it should be your number 60 on your list. Oh, well, there you go. Well, it's definitely on the list, so we'll just bump it up to the number one priority. So what appeals to you most about Costa Rica, Denise? I think it's a few things. I mean, partly it is the nature, um, the landscapes, the animals, but partially I think it is the sustainability as well. Oddly, I was actually watching a little video on YouTube earlier today about Costa Rica and the government and the energy that they derive from, from nature. They're, they're an incredibly green, uh, in more ways than one, yeah. country, not just visually. And I know it's been a priority for their government for years. So it just feels like a, a responsible place to go as well. And I think that's really fascinating to think about you know, electric vehicles and solar energy and all the different ways that they're they're taking care of the planet. Costa Rica has actually been one of the leaders in sort of sustainable travel and ethical practices and I think if that's something you're interested in and it's something that you have a passion about which I think everybody at the moment has an interest in it's definitely one of the places that I would I would recommend someone travel to just to see how well sustainability and eco tourism can be done. <laughs> Denise, we've we've talked about far flung destinations, we've talked about lots of areas, different continents, but you also travel closer to home, closer to England, um, and do short breaks as well, but also again on an escorted tour basis. Is that because they're more social or is that again coming down to itinerary? What is what's the motivation behind that? I think it's probably a bit of both, actually, Abby. Um, I have done, for example, I did the Jules Verne four or five day trip to, to Madrid. Ah. Um, and I'm not I'm not a beach holiday kind of a person, so I'm not going to go to Spain and go to the coast and 
lie in the sun for two weeks, but I was intrigued by, I'd been to Barcelona years ago, and I thought, well, I'd like to go to Madrid and soak up some culture. So yeah, so I've done that one. I also did Malta, actually, the little four or five day Malta trip. So those are more cultural, I suppose. Um, and then, like I say, I've been, I've been in the wilderness. I've done cultural trips through, well, I went to Iceland. So yeah, I've, I've been to Iceland with Jules Verne. I've done trips in, well, China. So Asia, some Europe, and, uh, and some African trips. So, and, and varied. I think that's one of the reasons I keep coming back to Jules Verne, actually. I've never been on a Jules Verne trip and been disappointed with the itinerary, I have to say. And there's such a range. Mm. So if, you know, if you're looking for a little cultural few days in a city, well, you can do that. If you want to go lie in a tent and listen to the funny sounds in the Botswana wilderness overnight, you can do that. If you want to go walk on the Great Wall of China, you can do that. And and I think that's that's why I keep I do keep doing trips with with Jules Verne is there's such a variety. There are lots of different things you can do all over the world. And if you know a company does it well, I sound like I'm kind of making a commercial for you here, but if you know yeah. a company does it well and you enjoy it, why wouldn't you keep going back? That's great. Wonderful. I ask every guest on the podcast this question and it often takes people back and they take a, a moment to think about it. But where in the world of everywhere you've traveled to, where in the world has captured your heart the most? Antarctica. You didn't even need to take a take a moment. Why no. Antarctica? Tell me more. I think it's just it's such a magical place. I mean, I, I set a goal of going to every continent quite a while back. Um, and it was shortly after that I saw, this is when I was still living back home in Canada, and I saw a little ad in the newspaper in the travel section. So it's going by, you know, paper, newspaper. It is going back a while, isn't it? And uh, expedition trips down to Antarctica, and I did that trip, and I signed up immediately. And it's just such an astounding place. I mean, I don't know if, I'm not sure if either of you have been, but it's right. beautiful. I mean, it, and... <laughs> And when I left Edmonton back home, it was minus 30. When I got to Antarctica, it was between minus 5 and plus 5. So it was balmy, really. Um, <laughs> the weather was fantastic. But it's a stunningly beautiful place. The glaciers, the mountains, the sea, and the wildlife is incredible. And I knew it would be visually beautiful. I don't think I realized how alive it would be. You know, the diff different kinds of whales, sea lions, d seals, three different kinds of penguins. And the bird life's astounding. Anybody who is really into bird watching, it is an astounding place to go. The, the variety's amazing. So, yeah, just, and, and the sense of being somewhere that few people get a chance to go. It's very, just absolutely captivating. Visiting mm. the extraordinary. Yeah. I have to say Antarctica's on my list. I think after that, it's on my mm. list too. Yeah, yeah. And that's the thing with this podcast. I'm very lucky that my list keeps growing and growing and growing the more I speak to some fantastic people and the experiences they've had. My list just keeps getting longer. Denise, thank you so much for joining us on this episode. It's been wonderful to hear your stories and your memories. And thank you so much for sharing them with us so open and honestly. Yeah, thanks so much, Denise, for coming in. It's It's been lovely to see you again. And thanks, as Abby said, to have shared all your, your amazing stories with us. Pleasure. I look forward to making more. Yeah. We hope you've enjoyed the latest episode of PASPA 2, People and Places. Look out for our next episode, where we'll be talking to more guests about the people and places that have inspired them the most. We'd love to hear your feedback, so please do get in touch. Thanks for listening.